So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he is doing, he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you, you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has him life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Father, we thank you that we can gather in the name of Christ this morning and that we can make a big deal of you. We can read of your word and sing songs that praise you. And I pray that as we do, that we would be strengthened in Christ, that you would increase in our estimation, in our hearts, in our life, and that we ourselves would decrease. I pray that you would grant us ears to hear today. We thank you for this time. Bless us, please. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, two things here. Um, one, we are going to be having pasta at dinner and a movie. Uh, P6 is going to be providing the pasta. The ladies are going to be providing the decoration and the desserts. And deacons are going to kind of organize and, and orchestrate men setting stuff up, cleaning up and tearing stuff down. And it's going to be hopefully a blessed night of fellowship with one another uh, if you've not been to that it's or something like that, we've had a handful of things like this. They're really chill. They're really easy. Uh, it's just kind of a hangout time. A little bit different than our carry-in meal uh, because it's just kind of, you know, literally a dinner and a movie. So we're just, we come, we hang out, we fellowship with one another. It is a great time of fellowship. Now, the next thing. Uh, Matt didn't ask me to do this, but I'm going to kind of make a big deal about this because this man who you just heard read the scriptures, uh, does some beautiful woodwork. And last week, or the week before, I forget which, was it last week? Last week he had a box of these ornaments that he was giving out to everybody. And that, that's a, a pretty significant and cool thing. And then this week uh, he brought some really cool and beautiful uh, pieces of what I would regard as artwork for the tree. And, and so if uh, you received one of those from... Matt, Matt, thank you very much. Uh, I just kind of wanted to make a big deal of it just because that's really, really cool. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. So with that, title for the sermon this morning is Those Who Hear Will Live. Jesus makes it clear in no uncertain terms. He is God, and mankind would do well to listen. Hearing's a funny thing, isn't it? Like, Shane came up and whispered something in my ear just, a, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes ago, and I didn't hear. All I felt was breath on my ear, right? So I'm like, he told me something important. What would you say? What did you say, by the way? It's working. Okay, cool. Terribly important at the moment for me to, I kind of thought that's what it was. Hearing is funny, right? It is 
sound waves made by vocal cords that end up hitting the ear or sound waves made by some other object hitting the ear. It's funny the things that we hear that we don't hear. Uh, men and women have selective hearing. I don't know if there's a switch on certain models once you get to a certain age that you choose to hear things or not to hear things. Uh, last night I'm laying on the couch and a friend comes and drops you know, uh, one of my daughters off and well, they were in the house, and it wasn't just my daughter. It was like three girls and a mom, and they're all talking, and I'm just laying on the couch, can't hear nothing until I do hear it, and then I'm like, ah, being kind of rude, laying on the couch, not, you know, saying hi, you know, or watching a basketball game, and I have a daughter who is listening to the referee yell at her for, you know, a certain infraction, and, and then her teammates are yelling at her, for the same infraction, and then the opposing team is yelling at her for that infraction, and then the crowd is all booing the referees for the infraction. Come on, they're seventh graders, let them play, you know. And the one voice she should be listening to, the coach, who spoke more clearly and pointed than any of them, somehow was not heard, right? Even though she grabbed her and pulled her right in and told her, what's up? It's interesting. Hearing is a very... Very interesting thing. Think about a bear crashing through the woods. If you hear that, what is the most likely response? It's probably not going to be, meh. You know, hopefully it's not, ah, right? But there's going to be some sort of response as that bear crashes through the woods, right? Or a wife speaking from the kitchen. Huh? There might be some sort of necessary response. I mean, you might... At the moment, act like you can't hear, but you're going to pay the piper later, right? The fact is, is we like to hear certain things and not hear other things. And then when we hear, again, it's not just hearing that there was a sound made, and then we kind of need to respond to that sound, maybe or maybe not. It is actually then interpreting what was said, right? The bear crashing through the woods. We all know what's going to happen there, right? He's wanting to come eat you, I mean, or play with you or whatever, right? But the fact is, we know what's going on there. That's why we scream and yell and run or shoot or do whatever, or just don't go to bear country, right? But when I hear somebody say something, uh, there's numerous things that that something could mean. We kind of learned a little bit of that in Sunday school this morning with the kids, right? We, we hear something said, well, what do you mean? You could mean any number of things by this. I need clarification. And then in hearing that and needing clarification, I can choose to take what is said or not take what is said. So part of hearing is speaking, and part of that, that whole dynamic is, is a, a you know, interpersonal set of communication skills that all of us have to some degree and all of us are kind of bad at. Like, have you ever been in a position where your boss tells you something, and you think you've got them right, but then when you get, you know, docked pay or penalized for this or chewed on for that, you realize, I didn't hear quite right. Or I wasn't listening. There's another word that's interesting, to listen. And many of us have been in the boss position where we speak and, or a parent position where we speak or, or a, a, you know, husband and wife situation where we speak and we do not feel as though we have been heard even though maybe that person can repeat verbatim back what you just said it's an interesting interesting thing i think about it all the time lately because i'm having a harder and harder and harder time of hearing and i see how important it is to be able to hear and interact with the people around me but not just hear again data and information coming in, but actually try to hear what is coming from that person. What do they mean? What are they saying? What are they getting at? And is it important for me to care? Well, again, from an interpersonal communication standpoint, yes. It's absolutely important for you to care, to try to figure out what a person is saying. We live in a day and age where somehow the hearer has an infallible sense of hearing and the communicator is one that's always having to make the effort to get the hear to hear rightly but let me tell you this when we read about 
the life of Jesus and the work of Jesus. He, uh, he communicated. He communicated clearly. He communicated often. He communicated with such abundant and prolific prose that if, you know, we were to try to write it all down, the Bible says we can't. And yet, people didn't hear him. Right? Kind of scares me. For me, right? Because I see myself not hearing people, my wife, my children, my whomever. I, I see myself filtering what I have heard through my own lens and what's going to benefit me. And is it highly likely that I've done that to God? I asked this question on Monday when I came to this passage. How am I going to be any different from the Jews that were not hearing what is being said? Because I think I know. Because I've got a theological degree and I've been doing this for 16 years and I've read the Bible more times than I can count. I have all of these justifying points and reasons for why I know what is here. And guess what? The Pharisees had even more. And so how do I, how do I not become like that? How, how do I actually hear what is being said and act accordingly? Because as we get into this, Jesus doubles down, as I like to call it. If we remember last week, we went through the healing at the Pool of Siloam. We went through the healing of the official's son. And that was all after the story of the woman at the well. And we got to the point in verse 18 of chapter 5 where you begin to realize the reason for the increased persecution. And we're going to read that and, and give you the explanation. Why is Persecution coming more and more to Jesus. The Jews were seeking more and more, all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So, here they are, they're not hearing him, and yet they are going to hear him, because what does Jesus say? He goes, yeah, you got me right. I am claiming to be equal with God. And let me make it even worse. I am the life-giving judge. The Father has life in him and I have life in me. And oh yeah, I am the judge. Now, he almost yells, and this is the Brian Johnson paraphrase, forgive me for it. In case you guys didn't hear me, let me say it again and twice as loud. I am God. Okay, that's you get why it's a paraphrase. Um, we have no idea if he was yelling or not. Fact is, he, he does double down. He does make sure everybody understands his claim to deity. I might argue that this is one of the most important passages in John regarding the deity of Christ. In particular, because it comes after verse 18, where it says the reason for his increase in persecution Jesus is God, and that is a magnificent claim. That is a magnificent, amazing claim. And the C.S. Lewis quote, quote is appropriate here, that Jesus is either a lunatic, a liar, or the Son of God. Right, that's a paraphrase as well, but you get the point. He's either object, objectively, absolutely insane, He's a megalomaniac of unparalleled proportions or, or he's actually God. And he doesn't pull any punches here. He gets after it. Now, we're going to dig into the weeds here, as Kevin Dickey likes to say. And as we dig into the weeds here, you as a hearer have a responsibility in hearing. I'm going to do the best I can, and, and I try every week to do the best I can, to be winsome and, and not boring and not overly long. And you're like, you failed at that one last week, Jonathan. Yes, I did. 52-minute sermon. You guys did great. And I'm going to try not to be overly long, and I'm, I'm going to try to be clear. And I'm going to try even at points to be funny because I like to laugh, and I like hearing you laugh. However, this is a deeply rich and complex passage that it would do you well to understand more clearly. So I'm not giving this warning as a warning to a boring sermon, 
that is about on its way. I'm giving this warning to say, hearer, hear the word of the Lord. Don't hear so as to hear for somebody else. You know, <laughs> Shane really needs to hear this one. Like, don't do that. All right? But also don't be like, you know what? He's right. That was kind of boring. Making a judgment on the preacher himself. Labor in your own right and mind to hear the word of the Lord. Because we're going to go through it in detail. Don't tune out. Labor to hear. Hear what the word of God has to say. Verse 19. In response to increased persecution, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only that what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. What does he say? I'm following the Father's lead. That's the first point. He follows the Father's lead. And he says it as a son. Now, in Jewish culture, being a son meant that you were equal and one with. All right, we, we've all seen the, the son, you know, express the spitting image of the father. We see the young boys, the young sons copying everything, imitating everything, following everything dad does. Dad walks like this, he walks like that. If he spits like this, he spits like that. If he untucks his shirt and, you know, won't tuck his shirt in going to church, he refuses to tuck his shirt in when he goes to church. I mean, all kinds of things a boy will imitate of his father. What Jesus is saying is, yep, absolutely, and amen. I can do nothing on my own accord, but only what I see the Father doing. He's claiming some special prerogative and privileged position, and I can do nothing apart from him. As he moves, I move, he says. This is Jesus in lockstep with the Father. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Now, heretics would love to be able to have this kind of claim on God. This close, privileged position uh, of gaining what might appear to be secret knowledge, but it is a knowledge that is given between a father and a son. The Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Oh yeah, he gave me the playbook, in other words. So I'm there, I can't do anything apart from him. He gave me the playbook and he loves me. That's another thing for the Jews that they didn't like. Can they really know if God loves them? That is one of the things that has become a marker of genuine biblical Christianity is an understanding of the love of the Father for his people and for the Son. If you want to have a good apologetic for any religion that is not genuine Christianity, it comes down to of the assurance of the love of the Father. The assurance of His favor. The assurance of grace. If you want to know how to witness to a Mormon, right there. They are not assured of grace. They think that they have to gain the love of the Father. Here's the thing, he says, I love you. I love you, and then we walk by faith in the obedience of faith. He says, I have made you my own. And here, Christ recognizes that right away. The Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And so everything that has been done up to this point is then tantamount or equal to what? The work of the Father. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. And he's like, oh, more is coming. More is coming. You, you ain't seen nothing yet. That reminds me of homecoming back in 1995. Um, you ain't seen nothing yet. Dun, dun. Yeah, that was his soundtrack at the moment as he's sitting there preaching, telling them, you've seen very little, but actually is going to happen. He's revealed to me his plan. He, he's given me his ex, es, eschatological map to how it's all going to end, and I'm going to show you so that you marvel at it. Pretty magnificent claim, is it not? Again, he is either the Son of God, the great King and the great I Am, the judge and the life giver, or he is not. There's no in-between with this cat. 
There's no halfway. There's no, this sounds like a good idea. I'm going to throw it into the pack of ideas that I run around with. This is a, I am the master and commander of all that there is. I know the Father's game plan. And right there, even if he stopped right there, the assumption should be from those that are hearing him, you know what, I should pay attention. I, I should pay attention. It's way more than like a, a dad coming into the room and saying, clean your room. You should pay attention. Why? Because you're probably going to get spanked. Or in Brian Johnson universe, he's going to come in with 55-gallon bags. He's going to pack all of the stuff in the bag and be like, obviously you didn't want it if you weren't taking care of it, so I'm just going to take this somewhere else. Trash can or somewhere. Amen. Yeah, Kevin, just amen to that. A bunch, bunch of moms and dads are amen in that. fact is, is we should listen we should hear we should labor to hear and like a child has to learn we too have to learn how to hear the one who is the ultimate authority for the father raises the dead and gives them life so also the son gives life to whom he will i don't know if you ever remember being grounded that was something my parents did. And grounding was not like real grounding. It's not like I had to like hide in my room forever. No, grounding was like an internment camp, right? You had to like go out and do more chores. Like how did they find more? But they did find more. They found more chores for us to do. And as a, you know, young teenager, I'm like, my life is over. Everything that you might define as life has then been taken from you. And here's the thing, if we walk in this world apart from Christ going down the path that promises life, there is one thing that is guaranteed if we're doing it apart from Christ, there's only death at the end of that road. Some of us have experienced it, some of us have seen it, many of us know it down in the depths of our heart, to follow down that path only leads to dead men's bones. And so here, listen where does it lead? Life. Leads to life because in the Father is life and in the Son is life. They both possess life. And so following down their path means life. And that's way better than getting back your PlayStation or, or getting your car back or getting your phone back. We didn't have phones back then, didn't care. Uh, but that's now the thing, getting your phone back or, or gaining some sort of privilege out of what you thought, my, I lost my life. Much more significant and much more important than the juvenile example that I've given is this example right here in which we can trust Christ to be the life giver. To be the one who gives us what we cannot gain and obtain on our own. Following the Father's lead. The Father judges no one, but he gives all judgment to the Son that all may honor the Son. Just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And right there, that should have sent them into a pulling and plucking out their own beard, grinding and gnashing of teeth, spurious anger over what he just said. He said, I am the judge. And if I said it, the Father said it. That's how it is. That's how closely he is following to him. And he has the judge speak. He, as the judge, speaks. And he speaks as to the authority that he possesses. Now, if you go back to chapter 3, and you get into verse 16 and following, and you remember that Jesus did not come to judge, right? Well, it doesn't mean that he didn't come to never judge. And if you begin to read it, you begin to think there's this, or, this sense that judgment has already happened in some measure, and it has. Judgment has happened already in some measure upon the entirety of humanity. Where did it start? At the garden when they got the boot and the cherubim and the flaming sword and all that stuff were put at the gate and God separated himself from mankind in judgment. And as we look forward, judgment befell man all the way through. Why? Because death came to the entirety of civilization. And then in Christ, what did he do? He took upon himself 
the wrath of God for the entirety of the human race. God's wrath that has been kindled because of our sin was placed upon His Son, Jesus. Judgment is there. And when Jesus did everything that God had commanded and called Him to do, where did He sit Him? In the place of king and judge. You hear me say it all the time, He is seated at the right hand of the throne of power. Yeah, he's put in a position of supremacy and preeminence, of might and splendor as the king and judge. If you read through the Old Testament, what did the kings function as? Judges. They also functioned as the benefactors that gave the community the good that was there. And what happened with the good kings? They were beloved. They loved them. What happened to the bad kings? Nothing but gravel and dead men's bones. And here's the thing, the judge speaks, and he's claiming the very seat of God. Now think about this for a few seconds, I want to kind of turn it to just a a different tone for just a few. If you had somebody walk through your life, whether it be on a television show, or knock on your door, or something like that, and they're like, hi, my name's Bob, Uh, I'm God, how are you? How would you respond? I've actually had that happen a few times. His name wasn't Bob. He didn't come to my door, but I was sitting on a couch one night talking to an individual, and he informed me that he is God. I then asked him how much he has had to drink. And he's like, a lot. I'm like, oh, okay. Do you only think you're God when you drink? And he goes, no, I think it when I'm sober as well. Okay, wow. He then informs me that I, too, could become God. (laughs) I was like, buddy, you're nuts. And he's like, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. It's one of the most freeing things ever. I'm like, "Uh uh-huh, as you're currently bound on the couch drinking alcohol to which you are addicted to, obviously. And he's like, yeah, well, maybe. What does that conversation demonstrate to you? The the guys, right, a little bit loose up here. Things aren't quite right. And here's the thing. If anybody came to you and said the same thing, we would all have the same response, would we not? Would we not think that they are a little bit loose upstairs, that they are a little bit crazy, that they've just, you know, got a really overestimated sense of themselves? So why is it different with Christ when he does it? I think we kind of assume the deity of Christ so often in the Christian church that we fail to see the magnificence of what is actually here and how we might respond if there was a guy walking around without a place to lay his head with a couple of people following him and he said, I am God, we might... You know, we, we wouldn't just like willing like, oh, he's here, and like run over and hug him, right? We might respond like we would respond if we were opening our front door and Bob came to it and said, I am God. So why do we believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Why do we think that his claims are true? like a real question i'm not expecting you to answer it out loud to me but i want you to actually think about that it's because of who he is and who he demonstrates himself to be many people at first probably rejected the concept and idea that he has got especially with these magnificent and amazing claims and yet from the very beginning of what we've been reading in john the things that he has done the things that are recorded the things that the community saw him do as he went from one end of the community to the next back and forth over the course of a couple of years he displayed and demonstrated himself to be who he is god fully god man fully man The authenticity that he possessed demonstrated himself. So he may have been sitting next to me on a couch, and I may have been like Thomas, doubting all the way. And when he did go to the cross, and he rose from the grave, and I come to my buddies, and I'm like, yeah, I want to see the wounds. I want to see them. And then when he comes in, what does he do? He demonstrates he is who he says he is. Self-authenticating realities happen all the time. All the time. If you're the best vet on the planet and you show up to the annual vet Olympics, do they have such things? And as you're engaging in the annual vet Olympics and you take gold medals and all the veterinarian stuff, then you have demonstrated you are the king vet, the champion of champions. That's self-authenticating, demonstrated off of 
how you do stuff, right? Or the best UPS driver on the planet. Never breaks the speed limit, always does exactly what he says. You know, always delivers a package in pristine timing and, you know, it's like a day early kind of a thing and they're never broken and it's just perfect, right? Just service with a smile. It's demonstrated by the authenticity of action within that. I could go around the room and pick on, you know, well, let's pick on Shane, the best blade driver, not just in the county, but the state of Wyoming, right? How do we know that these things are true? Well, they demonstrate themselves to be true because reality and truth is self-authenticating. You know what's real because it demonstrates itself to be that. Jesus does the same exact thing. And as he's standing here, there are many of those that believe when the judge speaks and he says these things, he is who he says he is. And yet even they were still wrestling just a bit, right? They walked with this dude for years and they struggled a little bit. Even John, no woman was greater born of women, but John and he even in his darkest moment struggled. Are you the Christ? This is a magnificent claim that is not always so easy to accept. And yet Jesus continues to say, honor is due to me. If you want to honor the Father, you better honor me. Truly, truly, verse 24, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Let's stop right there. Whoever hears. It's not just information coming into the ear ball. I don't know, is there a ball in the ear? Doc? No, it's not just information coming into the auditory caverns of my head. It is actually hearing and believing. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him, the father who sent me, he has what? Eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to what? Life. He is the giver of life. He is the one who takes you from that death to that life. All those who hear will what? Live. If you get a chance, go to Ephesians chapter 2, and it talks about us being dead in our trespasses and sins. And this right here, I believe, fully gives us this idea that we are going to be taken from death to life, from the death of our trespasses and sins to the life that is only found in Jesus Christ. Read chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. It's a great passage for that. Verse 25, he gets more in-depth into this listen, hear thing. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now, the question is, is what is that? Because this could be Lazarus, John chapter 11. What does Jesus do? He actually waits till he's dead when he could have gone and just healed him while he was still alive. He says, it's not time yet to go do it. He goes and waits till Lazarus is stinking in the grave. And then in no unclear or uncertain terms, he says, the dude's dead. They're like, oh no, he's just falling asleep in the Lord. Nope, nope, dead. And what does he do? Lazarus, come out. Lazarus comes out. All right, take the grave cloth off of him and what does he demonstrate those who hear his voice will live those who hear and not just in an auditory fashion but hear and respond by faith Lazarus was dead he's was, he's was a dead man that could not raise himself and yet God took him out of that grave he gave him life Matthew 27, 50 through 53 is another passage in which you get this idea that when Jesus cries out on the cross, it is finished, and then what happens? Like, there's a bunch of dead people that come out of the graves. Here he is, he cries out, and when he speaks, and they hear his word, that it is finished, the thing that he has been promising, what happens? The graves are opened, much like Lazarus. Much like us being brought to life from our deadness and trespasses. Why do you think I make such a big deal about God's word? 
because there's nothing I can creatively say on my own to you that will bring life. I can't do it. I can't save you. If I would, I could. I have tried to argue people into the kingdom of the heaven in the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't work. And yet I know that the word of Christ brings life. I know the word of Christ brings people out of the grave. I know the word of Christ is something that has His power behind it. And so what do we do? We speak the words of Christ. We open the Holy Word of God and I speak it week in and week out. This is a major significant reality. If you ever leave this church and go to another church and they don't open the Word of God and speak from Christ, go somewhere else. Let's say they have hard pews. They don't have any air conditioning or heating. Let's say their music is terrible. Let's say the preachers, I'm really getting into this now, the preacher's a hair lip, right? And yet he speaks the word of God that might be the place you need to be. All too often we make the things of importance within the church the unnecessary components of what we like or dislike versus is the word of God there. Because when he speaks, there's life. Whereas the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Jesus is the life-giving judge. The life-giving judge. That doesn't always go together. We like to think of the merciful judge. We like to think of the judge that kind of bends the rules for us on our behalf. The judge is like, ah, don't worry about that fine. Don't worry about that ticket. Don't worry about these things here. Here's a judge that does not bend the rules. There have been no rules bent. Every T has been crossed and I has been dotted. And in righteousness he kept the things that God has commanded. And we praise God. That he is the just judge, but he is also the life-giving judge. That he is the judge that bore on our behalf the penalty of our sins so that he might execute judgment and give life. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in tombs will hear his voice. Now let's stop right there. You might be wondering why in verse 24 I equated it to those other passages that I quoted to you in, in passing about saying, I think verse 25 is talking about these specific events. And the, and the reason is because it's talking about it's immediate, right? These things are going to happen. Well, right here, this puts it off to the future. And he talks about all the tombs. Reminds me of First Thessalonians chapter 4 where it talks about all the graves being opened up. There is going to come a time when everybody who's gone to the grave is opened up from the grave and then it will have this judgment that happens. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. It is going to be the separation of the sheep and the goats. And so, how do we do good to the resurrection of life? Do I just need to become a better person? We all know the answer to that is no. And if you don't, you should. Those who do good to the resurrection of life have done what? They've placed their trust and their faith where? In Jesus. They've heard his word. They've trusted in him. They've given him themselves. They've repented of their sins and they live a lifestyle characterized by faith and repentance. That is the good work of God is to believe in him, to Believe what he is saying, even if it is hard. Even if it requires you doing something different. And let me tell you, it does. It does. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, can you continue to live as the criminal that you were? When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, can you continue on killing, stealing, and destroying? When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, can you continue to walk unrepentantly down that path of satisfying 
your flesh with the things of the world? The answer is no. You cannot live like the devil and be expected somehow to be accepted into the fellowship of the saints. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, it is faith and repentance together. And it's not saying you are perfect, but it is saying that your faith will lead you steadily, continually, characteristically away from the world and the things of the world. You will be putting to death the deeds of the flesh by the power of the Spirit that dwells within you. You will be manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. This will become a part of who you are because of who dwells within you, because of the authority that He possesses to give you life and sanctify you. There is a change. So why theologians call it a conversion. There is something different about you, and it's because your master has changed. The one who is the authority in your life, you're listening to him. You're hearing what he says. And by faith, you're trusting in him. And so, Christian, I pray that that would be exactly where we're at. Not perfect. Not doing it all right, but trusting in Jesus and his authority, trusting in his might. If you know not Christ, and you're still wrestling with who he is and, 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 and how he works in this salvation stuff and, and all that, continue to read, continue to sit in the preaching, and continue to talk. There are many people sitting around you that would love to say, hey, this is Jesus. This is how he's changed my life. This is how he's worked amongst me. And my family, grab a hold of them. I pray that we would be a people that would do that and that it would shape and modify us and who we are and what we fellowship in more and more and more. Because it does, it currently does. And by God's grace, may it continue to do so. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time that we can gather in the name of Christ. And I pray, Lord, that we would trust in your power, your authority, your goodness. Trust in the fact that you are the life giver and you are the judge. And that life is promised to come. And if we have him, in some manner, we've already gone from death to life. Raised to walk in newness of life. Bless us this morning as we sing. Bless us this morning as we fellowship in the name of Christ. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray.